Okay, we're back here live in, uh, in Germany. We are in Frankfurt, Germany. This is siliconangle.com, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. This is HP Discover. We've been here all day for day one of the European tour for HP. My co-host is Dave Vellante, analyst at wikibon.org. Uh, offering the best open source free research on the planet right now, leads the market in two areas, big data, and now recently with the new groundbreaking uh, research out called Software-Led Infrastructure. Go to wikibon.org, you'll find that killer research, Software-Led Infrastructure. Of course, I'm the founder of SiliconANGLE, and that's where all the, the river of news, opinion, and analysis sits. That's where the publishing is, and we are happy to bring you all the coverage here at HP Discover. Um, this is our wrap-up segment of day one. Um, Dave, I think that um, HP has clearly shown to me that there's still HP on one hand, but it's very, very clear that they are looking at the marketplace going, you know what, we are not down, our chips may be on the table right now, everything's all in, value destruction is happening, the news is not good, they got a little bit of a black eye with, with Meg Whitman's announcement around the autonomy right down, and of course EDS before that, but they've had some successful acquisitions with, ED, uh, with 3PAR, very strong showing by the three-part acquisition today. Outside of that whole bad news on HP, clearly these guys are not sitting, sitting uh, still. They've integrated autonomy, and the big story here, in my, at least on my headline, is big data is now native within all of HP's products and services. We said that when we were in Las Vegas for HP Discover in the US. They embraced the autonomy acquisition. They've added their own stuff, so this is not just autonomy. So this is a big data is now part of the DNA within HP, as well as software-led infrastructure. Software-defined infrastructure, software-led infrastructure, whatever you want to call it, HP has clearly got those two elements as their core, and we're excited because that matches right with our, our editorial and our research agenda, Dave. So I think to me, that's my big takeaway. What's your take? Well, HP's got a complicated portfolio, as we talked about before. They go from you know, the device to the data center, and that's all well and good. Um, I think, though, that what we found out from Meg Whitman on the last earnings call was that while 25% of the revenue of HP is in the enterprise group, over 40% of its profits are there, and we heard Dave Donatelli tell us that increasingly, John, HP is going to be reporting on that basis. Now, the reason why I think that is important is because you look at what's happened in the storage. I've contended all along, or for many years, that HP's biggest challenge has been HP. You know, if particularly, let's take the storage opportunity. It's been sitting there for years. HP really wasn't organized to take advantage of it. They bring in Donatelli, and they began to organize to do that. There's still some issues there. You know, they're tweaking, they move services, uh, product support services under Donatelli, that was a good move. I'll give you an example though, John. HP's data protector software, it's storage, and it should be in the storage group in my opinion. That little change would allow them to compete even more effectively with EMC. So there's still a little bit of tweaking going on, it just takes more time but because of the size of, of, of HP's organization. But having said that, HP's strategy is in storage is now much more clear. They're putting the, a lot of wood behind 3PAR, which has been a, a real home run for the company. Well, before we get to 3PAR, I want to ask you a question on the, on the reorg. Do you think HP's effectively positioned themselves o, a, a well within the reorg that they have now outside of those little tweak spots? Within, within the enterprise group, I, I think absolutely. Um, again, I think they've, they've been adjusting things, settling in, so yeah, I think they're they're poised to compete in networking, they're poised to obviously competing in servers and poised to compete in storage very well now. And I think you called this one, John, Meg Whitman referenced this in her keynote. Really, it's, HP is the, the one company, and, I get, and I get, you could throw Dell in here too, but, but, but HP is really the company in the traditional enterprise business that has all three, server, storage, and networking for convergence and for software-led. And they got a strong story there. Well, we know Meg reads our blog, so obviously, uh, she's taking some pointers from us and that it's all good. Now, in all seriousness though, I think that HP's um, uh, infrastructure side of the house is very tight, Dave. I'm really impressed. Um, you know, a lot of people try to criticize that group, oh, they're not this and that, but HP has their act together. They've had it for, together for a while on the converged infrastructure side of things. I just don't like the word converged infrastructure. I think it's a little bit outdated. I think modern is a better word. I think they've got a modern uh, vision around how the data center is going to evolve. I think it's, it aligns with the vision that Wikibon put out around software-led infrastructure. So they're solid there. I, now, I, on the big data, this is not all autonomy, and I think that's another key point that I want to make. I think that, um, you know, again, it's like we were talking with Sean Kenny. they got a lot of large players that aren't, it's really hard to knock out one of these big guys. 
Um, it's harder than knocking out a heavyweight champ, right? So I think what you're going to see is, you know, look at IBM, John. IBM has used its financial prowess and its service is excellent to really do well and make a lot of money for its shareholders. And I think HP can take a similar playbook with a different route. So my point is that HP's working on the balance sheet, they're cleaning that up, they're paying down their debt. They got to put themselves in a position to be able to make strategic acquisitions. Um, you know, autonomy, we don't even have to revisit it. Uh, so Dave, let me go down the highlights for today. I want to share with you the highlights for today. One, we have the interview we had with Colin Mahoney with Vertica, um, 6.1, they announced code name Bulldozer, that's out at the apps, app system. That's the Vertica. Vertica's holding their head up high, and I think they, they should. I think they've gotten kind of overshadowed by the autonomy acquisition, and you know, that's obviously, Vertica's standing strong, and again, Colin Mahoney is an entrepreneur executing within, within HP, just like David Scott is, so that's real testament to, to the Vertica. Um, analytics is just the key thing for these guys right there, so you know, that was a good interview. Um, Dave Donatelli, he's the EVP, he runs the Enterprise Group. You know, convergence, software-led infrastructure, um, software-defined uh, networking storage and servers, and obviously the cloud. Cloud is important to HP, we're going to see more of that. Solid state is the, is, was another key message from Donatelli. Tom Joyce, who runs is on the sales side over there, you know, store, serve, six, 7,000, uh, an object base and file base is really the hot product. The three par is really expanding the growth there, and uh, that was really key. Um, we had, uh, you know, Stephen DeWitt here, who's uh, really one of the top executives. HP's lucky to have a guy like that. He's got a lot of energy, he's dynamic. He's got a lot of experience. This guy, I've been following his career, has done this amazing job uh, and he knows his stuff. And you know, he, he gets the transformation. He knows um, and confirmed and validated what Donatelli said. And what we've been talking about, Dave, is that you know, we are going to see this new era to be hugely transformative, similar to the mainframe and client server. So that's going to be really, really huge. So, you know, Stephen DeWitt, kudos to him. And, and the, the, in the comment about big data from him was great. David Scott, the leadership with three par acquisition, what's fantastic. Your, what's your take on HP's big data strategy, John? I mean, we, you, you and I have been interviewing a lot of people on this topic. You really got us into this uh, uh, business uh, several years ago. What's your take on HP's big data strategy? What do you think? I think HP is um, extremely well positioned for big data, and I think the strategy right now is, um, it's hard to describe, I mean, and I'm trying to find the words for it, but I would say it this way. They, they dip their toes in the water, they probably have a lot of infighting amongst the company around what is big data. We heard similar uh, top executives at SAP tell us privately that you know, big data is too hype. So I think HP kind of looks at big data as, hey, we have so much going on in our business from the research in HP labs of photonics to some running some of the biggest enterprises in the world that we don't have time to kind of play in the hype world. So I think they're now beyond that. I think HP clearly sees that their strategy from a business transformation standpoint, it will be grounded in big data and providing essentially computing cloud like resources to the, their largest customers. So one, validation. So I think their, Dave, their strategy right now is step one of embracing big data. They, I still don't think HP has clearly understood how, what they really got in their, in their hands right now. And I said yesterday in my blog post that they have lightning in a bottle. HP right now could move on the marketplace in a huge way and move the ball down the field if they lock into two things, big data, and software-led infrastructure. I truly believe that that's the top-level messaging and, and, and everything around you can hang around that is business benefit, business value, credibility, technology, all the elements that they need to show the marketplace really hang around big data and, and software-led infrastructure. So I think their strategy is to expand on big data, not overhype themselves, because they got a lot of different work to do and, and tweak within the company. So, so I, think, I think they're going to continue to explore that. And I think you might see uh, big data be much more strategic and native in all, all their products. And once they see it in the products, I think then it'll render themselves into global messaging. So I want to talk a little bit about Meg's keynote. Um, you were a man in the, the cube at the time. Um, she, she addressed this audience of around 9,000 individuals and she talked, she started by talking to the audience, John. She said, I love this company, and I love its people, and I love its customers, and I love its partners. And then the other thing she said is, and something that we've said, you want us to win, and all the customers I talk to, this is Meg Whitman speaking, I go around the, the, the world, customers want us to win. And it's true, John, people want HP to win, they're rooting for this company. The other thing she said, it's hard to kill founder's DNA, talking about Hewlett and Packard and their ethos around customer service. 
And then she, the other thing she said, which then she went on to essentially repeat her quarterly conference call, we are on a very solid financial foundation. They're profitable, $120 billion in revenue. They generated $4 billion in cash last quarter, 10.6 billion for the year. That's more cash that, than, that's, than is generated by Coca-Cola, Disney, FedEx, McDonald's, um, and, uh, Visa, a number of other great companies. Uh, and they also paid down $5.6 billion in, in debt last year. I can't emphasize enough how important it is in this day and age for HP to really strengthen its balance sheet. Dave, you know, you get me all um, emotional when you talk about the, uh, Meg Whitman's comments about the DNA of the founders because, you know, being an entrepreneur, founder of companies myself, I understand kind of that perspective. But let me just tell you um, what I truly believe. If you look at IBM, we talked about the IBM turnaround versus HP's turnaround, and, and, and this, is, this is my prediction on HP. IBM was turned around from a position of almost going under, right? So, you know, Meg Whitman referenced that in her earnings call that HP was almost running out of cash, and they turned it around in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that was elegant, effective, professional. But it, it hurt a lot, a lot of things. But IBM got turned around because IBM had such great brand equity. The thing about HP that people aren't factoring into their turnaround plan is what you just said. People want HP to win because HP, from Bill and Dave, and this is why Meg has got my respect, even though she's not technical, uh, from an, she's got operational skills, but she recognizes that Bill and Dave, Bill Hewlett and, and Dave Packard built a big business, big company on a lot of values. They built a company that had core values and had a DNA that, that changed people's lives. HP truly changed the lives of many of their employees, many of their customers, many of their shareholders, and the, the charitable contribution that HP uh, founders and the, and the employees went on to do was amazing. Two, they changed industries. HP grew uh, over the years since the founding and has been in participating in industries in good times and bad. So their culture and their DNA and their brand equity, not just the company brand, but their entire culture has such longevity. So I believe that that's going to carry the day for HP. Now that's just on that piece. The products and services, they actually have good stuff. So, so they could put this together pretty, pretty easily. You know, I've said on record that I think this is one of the easiest turnarounds uh, that anyone could do because we got such, so much working for them. So I hope they don't screw it up, but I think they can do it very easily. And I think it's a matter of focus and just clarity and simplicity. Simplify the messaging, simplify the positioning, simplify the, uh, the, the products. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. I'm rooting for them to win. I think a lot of people are rooting for them to win. And all the headline, negative headlines are really around just people who don't know the company. Well, so after Meg went through the financial discussion, and, uh, and I think did a good job affirming that she's focused on the balance sheet, which I can't, again, emphasize enough that's critical. She talked about the tectonic shifts in the business. You would expect a CEO to put forth her vision. She talked about a new style of IT driven by cloud, mobility, and big data. She used that term, big data. Here's, this was interesting, John, and I, this is where I thought she had some credibility. She said, when I was the CEO at eBay, I used to say this all the time, we have to build the church for Easter Sunday. Meaning, we got to build to peak capacity. Um, and then she said, that's changing. And she specifically mentioned two companies, Salesforce and Workday as examples of innovation that are changing the way in which organizations can actually run their IT. So this new style of IT being very elastic, and again, she used uh, uh, Salesforce and Workday, a company, as you know, I'm, I, I love Workday, I love what they're doing, you know, really bringing Salesforce style uh, uh, a model of computing to HR, but use those as examples, point being, if we were doing eBay today, we wouldn't have to build all this customization in. We would be able to respond much more quickly. And companies have the advantage of doing that today. So essentially she said that HP's strategy is really simple, to provide solutions for this new style of IT. And then she essentially talked about how employees want a consumer experience at work. At the same time, CIOs want security. So HP's strategy is to bridge those two. Uh, and to bring those two worlds together, that consumer, consumerization of IT with the need for security. She said, John, she was recently at a conference of the C CEOs of the 200 largest companies uh, on the planet, and the number one topic that consumed the day and a half was security, security, security. So, now the other thing she said, which is interesting, she must have been listening to theCUBE, she said, we are the only company with a strong market position across servers, storage, and networking and we are the only company with 
software defined expertise in each of those. Yes. And then she talked about <laughs> Gen 8, she talked about uh, Moonshot, she talked about reinventing uh, the network through software defined uh, networking. We're bringing business logic into the switch. And then she said, I want to make this clear. We are 100% committed to autonomy, you know, notwithstanding all the challenges. She made a couple of jokes about the challenges, and et cetera. And then she talked about services. So she touched on all the points. She mentioned printers. She didn't mention WebOS. No mention of WebOS. Um, and, and minimal mention of HP's play in mobile. Talked a lot about printers, enterprise group, uh, and, and, and the components of enterprise group talked about storage and services. Um, but essentially laid out a strategy of cloud security and information optimization, which I look at as, as big data. And um, their cloud piece focus on convergence, which I agree with you, it's a little old. They really need to advance that. I think they should be pounding uh, uh, software led and then uh, and modern architectures. And then the second thing she did talk about within the cloud was how they're building on OpenStack we heard some guests today, is OpenStack ready for prime time? I think I heard the answer is, eh, not quite yet, but we plan to make it there. Um, and as I say, security and information optimization. But bottom line strategy, to provide solutions for that new style of computing, in a nutshell. I think, you know, I think OpenStack is a hedge, but you know, Dave, just to kind of tie some thoughts that jump out at me from when, you hear, when I hear you talk about the, the keynote, I think, one, the focus is very relevant. And I think HP has to be relevant. They've always been relevant because they got a lot of customers that have relevant, relevant pro, uh, solutions to, to be rolled out to and problems to solve and business to do. But here's the thing that's going on right now, in my opinion, and all the data that we get from, from the acquisition of, the, of, our, of our talks and research and our publishing. The enterprise market is building out. People are retooling, people are building, and people are building new architectures, modern architectures, retrofitting existing ones, building new ones, greenfield opportunity here, restructuring here. There is absolutely money to be spending. There's a boom in enterprise up and down the stack, and it's back to the classic formula, computing and applications and everything in between. So if you look at the fundamentally, Dave, I think that's what we're seeing. Everything has this distributed, distributed concept to it, distributed computing concept. It's computing power and applications. That's always been the part of the biggest track uh, trends that we've seen, the inflection points that we've seen, computing and applications. Now, taking that forward, what does that mean today? Computing, that's everything, right? <laughs> What's applications? Big data, mobile, software. Middleware, that's software. So I think that's a very clean vision from Meg. Now the question I have is, why not WebOS? And I think the answer would be, they're just, it's a distraction right now. What I would do with WebOS? Yeah, what would you do? I'm dying to hear this. <laughs> I no, would, I'm serious, you got a great perspective. I would dial up, I would call in uh, HP Labs, and I would dial up a Navy SEAL Team 6 engineers, and if I can't find them, I'd get them, hire them, Brightest Minds, Applied Research Project, dial up WebOS Android integration for a mobile OS that's free and integrate that into the, a handheld mobile phone and all their PC hardware and offer the quality products that HP's known for to the consumer. Focus on quality, stay in that business, it's a channel, it's a hardware channel, too valuable to even to give up and I would dial up the smartest engineers it's like that scene in Apollo 13. Build this filter. That one scene in Apollo 13 where the guys, they're trying to get back to Earth and they don't have any oxygen left. They throw all of the scientists in a room and they're saying, this is what we got to work with. Let's get these guys home. So to me, that is the approach HP needs to take right now in, in the mobile business. Throw those guys in a room, dial up the smartest people they got and say, I need a mobile platform. I need mobile on the hardware. Build it, Android and or iOS, done deal. John, that was good, I like that summary. Now, so let me just, let me just follow up with a question. So you're talking about Android integration. Why not just hop on the Android bag, uh, bandwagon? Um, absolutely, first, yes, to guess. I mean solely, <laughs> without, the, without the WebOS piece. Why, why bring, what's the value of bringing that WebOS piece? Help us understand that. Um, well, I think it's as a hedge to look at what it, what's in their tool chest, right? So one, I don't think WebOS needs to be involved in Android, so my, if I was running that little team, I'd say look at, Android, lead with Android. Android is growing really, really fast, and it needs the most work, and it has the most suppliers. HP knows that environment. It's like the industry standard kind of positioning that HP's used to. Android's perfect. I would go all in on Android. 
all in on Android. Then I'd go back to the web OS, whatever's left of it, and cobble in some proprietary hooks that were part of web OS, make them open, use that as either uh, one-off protocols and or software to hook into other HP assets. Just like the storage groups hooking into, with converged storage, into some of their products. So web, web OS gives them a vehicle to possibly tie in some value around other HP components. But on the, on the mobile side, I'd go pure Android. So add value uh, yeah. where you differentiation. can. differentiation. And differentiate. But from a focus standpoint, do that after Android, right? The other part of that game is that HP was not a player in the PC business. They had the PC originally back in the day when HP in the 80s, the PC was part of their enterprise sale and had proprietary a bus called HP, uh, H they had an HP interface bus, HPIB, that was for the mouse and you know, non-proprietary. When HP moved into the PC business, industry standard PCs, no one would buy them. And then within a matter of three or four short years, they became literally in the top three, and eventually knocking down Compaq and I IBM and Compaq in that order, and then ultimately buying Compaq and becoming number one in the world over, my, uh, over Dell and, and the clones. HP right now can be a fast follower and get a position in a matter of two to three years of Apple-like mojo, and that's, to me, I would be going for that. It's a lofty goal, it's a bold move. I would not give up. And that's why I was very critical of Leo Apotecker because he was just like, ah, eh, get rid of that. I don't want that. When it could become a, a great lever for HP as a channel. And if HP wants to be part of the consumerization trend in IT, you got to provide a phone. Uh, look at Marissa Mayer at Yahoo. She had, we're going to go off Blackberry and give her an iPhone. The consumer experience is where it's at. And I think she's dead on about that and, and kudos to her for that. Well, I think you're right, John. I mean, if, if you're going to be in that business, <laughs> you got to have devices that appeal to that business. So I have to ask so. you, I want to add, Dave, I want to ask you a question because um, um, I want to talk about the storage uh, announcement yesterday. So storage is no longer boring. It's been sexy since we started doing theCUBE, but right now, more than ever, storage is at the center of all the action. And it continues to be, we thought it might not be, but it continues to be the center with solid state. Dave Donatelli addressed it. I want to get your, your analysis, because you've been following this, this sector for many moons, okay? One, your, your commentary around, one, the announcement, but two, how aggressive HP is against the competition. I mean, this is the first time I've seen HP take the gloves off and actually go after the competition directly with some serious, serious rhetoric um, and challenge. So, comment on storage announcements and their position and their competitive aggressiveness. Well, I do think, number one, there was a lot of meat on this bone um, for the storage announcements. I mean, I, I've always been a big fan of three-part. John, I left the business for a number of years. I came back in, I asked my friend John MacArthur, who are the companies I should look at? He said, the two companies you should start looking at right off the bat, 3PAR and Data Domain. Those are the two most interesting companies out there. So I went and visited 3PAR and, and really was blown away by what they were doing. And, and I think that um, while the company struggled for a long time, as soon as they got popped into HP, it just completely exploded. And I say struggled, struggled from a financial standpoint, struggled to make a profit, but once they were inside HP, forget it. And I think it's the smart move to put the wood behind the 3PAR arrow in that storage portfolio for the primary storage. Very, very smart move for, for HP to do that. Um, I think the, 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 the store once piece, the deduplication, I think HP was late, I mean I know, HP was late to market there. Um, the question is, is it too little, too late? I think no, I think HP will do okay there, but I think HP needs that software component. As I said before, I would love to see data protector move into the storage group. I think the storage group could do a better job of integrating and exploiting that product. I understand the logic be behind keeping it separate. Of course, it's a big chunk of revenue. They want to pump up their software revenues, but I think they get a lot more exploitation if they organize that differently. So, I mean, I think that's good what they've done. The whole, you know, uh, 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 restore performance, you know, that's, that's good, but let's face it, it's, it's, it's important when you need it, uh, but the rest of the time you just back it up, you just want to get it done with. So, I like their marketing there. I think I like their marketing a lot. To your point, they're taking off the gloves. I think the store all piece, um, I love that conceptually. I think they're going to have a hard time initially finding places for it, but I think over time they could do very, very well with it. I love the Express Query. David Floyer is actually writing up an analysis right now of store all. Uh, particularly I like, John, 
If you look at software-defined uh, storage or software-led storage, we just wrote a piece on this in Wikibon, and we talked about layering services on top of commodity hardware. Now that is nothing new. Google has been doing that for a long, long time. We've predicted back in the 2006 time frame that eventually the enterprise would get there. What is new is really bringing disparate chunks of metadata today that are locked inside of servers and storage and networks and even within those uh, uh, domains, different silos, bringing that metadata into a a, a, a high-speed access repository, even if it's a virtual repository, that you can access and make decisions on top of that. Blend that with Flash, which is the other piece that I want to hear more of from HP, how they're leveraging Flash across servers and storage. I want to see more collaboration between those organizations. They are in the catbird seat, and I will tell you right now, John, others are working on this problem, VMware in particular with, with EMC, so I want to see HP get more aggressive there. But so on balance, I think HP is, is you know, I, I play ping pong. You play ping pong, I got a good forehand. I play my uh, forehand a lot. Beer pong. I'll run, a beer pong. I'll run around <laughs> my backhand to hit my forehand. I think that's what <laughs> HP's doing right now. It's hitting its forehand. What's the forehand? The forehand is three par, and, and that's really where they're, they're What winning. about the competition question? I mean, they're pretty aggressive right now. What do you think about uh, their aggressiveness toward the competitors? Well, I mean, let's, let's run them down. Look, EMC, that company has been a leader from, from you know, the day that it, it, it became a leader in storage, and it's, it's held on to that lead. VMware is the secret sauce there. I mean, I think EMC has huge challenges with its legacy storage business. I mean, unbelievable challenges. EMC is masking those challenges with <laughs> good engineering and services. And they can, they can do that for a long, long time. I've said, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times. If you take a hundred points of value, 50 points are in services. Look at IBM, folks. IBM has masked many of its product efficiencies over the years with great services. And, and it's printed money as a result. And I think EMC can do the same. EMC says we're not a service company, we're not a service company. EMC has fantastic services. EMC Global Services is a secret weapon that they don't really talk about a lot. If you look at their financials, their global services business is growing faster than their product business. What does that tell you? It tells you that customers are sticking with EMC and they're able to monetize those relationships. So EMC, I, I just don't see that company giving up its, its well, top Well, they're going to throw haymakers at EMC because EMC is, like you said, on the services side, they're gearing up and they have a presence, yes. and their presence in the marketplace is, is awesome. David Scott was very critical of EMC, talking about the five different architectures. Wow. Well, you know what? The customers might not care. Well, or, but, I, I or, think they, you know. but I think they do care, and I think that my, my guess is, I mean, I certainly don't have inside information here, but I bet you if you sat in one of Dave Donatelli's meetings, and Dave Donatelli and Sean Kinney and, 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 and Randy Seidel and Tom Joyce and on and on and on, these guys know EMC, and they said, all right, what's EMC's biggest weakness? Well, its biggest weakness is its biggest strength, its breadth of its portfolio. They got one of everything, so let's attack that. That's what HP's doing. Okay, smart, great. EMC's not going to roll over for that. Now, let's take a look at NetApp. NetApp is one of these all the wood behind one arrow pro, uh, companies. ONTAP is the number one storage operating system out there. So it's, it's everything to everybody, and it's, you know, it's, come, it's hitting its limits, right? It's hitting its limits, bumping up against the ceiling. That's what NetApp's trying to do with clustering. Well, I, think, I think David Scott's comment against NetApp is kind of a, not, not a heavy punch, because you know, NetApp, I, NetApp is one of those companies, Dave, that you know, I've been following them for a very long time, and they've, they're nimble, man. They are, when they organize, they could be mercenaries, right? They are, they are really hard charging, okay? They have a really good culture. Um, I was talking to uh, my friend Chris over there, Chris Cummings at NetApp, and you know, the employees there have a great culture, like HP, right? And so, so you know, you can't count these guys out. I talked to Val on theCUBE, and NetApp kind of makes the right moves at the right time. So to me, I think NetApp is not as big as these other guys, but Man, you can't count those guys out. They always seem to make well, a good move. So here, here's what's going on with NetApp. NetApp's going through a transition right now. They bought Ingenio to expand its TAM. We knew this was happening. NetApp had a, like a, a fantastic 2010, very tough comparisons in 2011, and, and, and tough in 2012. So it's been growing fast, and now it's feeling the, the pain of having to compare against high growth years. So it, it bought Ingenio to expand its TAM, it's, it, it enhanced its partnerships, it increased its channel, 
This is all about TAM expansion. We've seen this before. Tom Georgians knew this was coming. He's in the hot seat. He knew he had to increase his available market opportunity. So they're in a transition. NetApp's been through a number of transitions before. The, no the knock on NetApp is it doesn't scale. Well, that's what clustering ONTAP 8 and 8.1 and, and follow-ons are all about, is, is the, uh, you know, bringing clustering to the enterprise. I've talked to a guy that I really respect, Roger Cox from Gartner Group, about this. I talked to David Floyer about this, another guy I respect. They actually think this is the real deal and NetApp will figure it out and be able to scale that architecture. If they do, imagine if NetApp is able to scale to mainframe class with clustering, with the single operating system. That's going to be dangerous, but they haven't done it yet. So, like, clustering's hard, like, as we know. Like I said, you know, don't count NetApp. No, and the other area that's interesting is we've been covering a company called Aerospike, one of the hottest startups that no one's ever heard of yet, but I'm telling you right now, they might rise really fast. Aerospike is doing a lot of in-memory stuff, so you know, a company like that, you put that into the NetApp ecosystem, I mean, a lot of things could go on there. So like, you know. So let's go down the list. Now Dell, we talked about Dell, we're going to be at Dell next week, the uh, uh, Dell World, and that's going to be interesting to see. You know, Dell's another company going through a huge transformation. They, they took a shot right, right. today at, uh, uh, yesterday they took a shot at, with the fluid architecture right at HP. I like the, the moves, to I love the fact that Dell goes and buys these companies and they don't apologize for going out and doing inorganic uh, R&D and then they focus on integration. That's what the fluid data architecture is all about. It's hard to integrate. I mean, look at EMC. EMC has never really put that much emphasis on integration until very recently because I think it's realizing that this whole software-led thing and the VMware opportunity is forcing their hand, but Dell really focuses on integration, so I give them high marks for that. Um, you know, HDS is another one, kind of a, a, a nichier player, but they're doing some interesting things, very reliable. Um, and then Oracle, right? Oracle is this wild card. Everything's in the red stack, and Oracle's very, very competitive. Why? Because it sells to application owners. It sells to CIOs. Well, it Dave, doesn't sell to storage <laughs> admins. Dave, this is day one wrap up, and uh, I'm excited because when we get tomorrow, full day of interviews, but I'm also excited because H, the big story here is HP, entire business is going to be revolving around two major mega trends, big data and software-led infrastructure. And I'm excited, you know why I'm excited, Dave? Because those are the two areas that we are number one in. SiliconANGLE and Wikibon are number one in big data coverage and software-led infrastructure. And go to siliconangle.com, you'll find all the big data and all the software-led infrastructure news, analysis. You go to wikibon.org slash big data, you go to wikibon.org slash SLI, you'll find software-led infrastructure, uh, data that you can't find anywhere else. Those two areas, we are the undisputed leader in media and research, big data and software-led infrastructures. HP is going down those paths, that's exciting for me, that's exciting for the marketplace, and that's exciting for our users. So, so our, our readers, our, our viewers, and the people who buy the research from you guys is going to be benefiting greatly because <laughs> HP is, is a big player in this business, Dave, and I couldn't have been more thrilled to hear that news. Yeah, I agree, John. Um, I think this, you're, you're seeing this ship righted. You call that the easiest turnaround in history. I think there's a, you know, a lot of people will go, what, what's Furrier talking about again? He's out, but in a lot of ways, you're absolutely right. This is much, let me put it this way, much easier than the IBM turnaround in the 90s. There's no question in my mind, because financially, they're much, much stronger. And uh, so I think that you know, it's a matter of focus and execution. Okay. Yep, I, uh, I can defend that easy turnaround anytime. It's pretty simple. You got to just simplify, stay core. HP's got all the elements. It's about tooling it together. Throwing those engineers into a room and say, build this. Uh, very, be very focused on those strategic products. Stop the infighting. A lot of people want to see them win. I mean, I talk to employees at HP that have been here 25, 30 years, still here, and they still love the company. People are rooting for HP to win. I would agree. The big story here at HP today is big data is native within all their products and services, and the infrastructure, computing market's changing, and they're wrapping it all around software while extending the lead in the hardware. That is HP's focus, and uh, we had a lot of great conversations for all the reruns and all the on-demand videos go to youtube.com slash siliconangle. That's youtube.com slash siliconangle and look for the channel called HP Discover 2012 Germany and you'll find all the videos. In the next couple of days you'll see all those videos get popped up. A lot of great guests uh, from Dave Donatelli down to uh, entrepreneurs and uh, influential bloggers and analysts all here in theCUBE. This is day one wrap up. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow for day two at HP Discover. That's a wrap from, uh, in, from Germany.